Good afternoon, everyone. Mr. Lee Zi Yang, Chairman of our SUTD Board of Trustees, Professor Chong Dao Chong, President of SUTD, Professor Maria Zuber, Vice President of Research at MIT, and our SUTD Board of Trustees, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, as well as our SUTD family, a very warm welcome to SUTD this Friday afternoon. So I'm Corina Chung, Senior Director for Sustainability at SUTD, and I'm delighted to be your MC today. So at SUTD, we are proud to incorporate the art and science of technology and design into a multidisciplinary curriculum that seeks to nurture technically grounded leaders and innovators to serve societal needs. Sustainability is integrated into education, research, governance, and campus test bidding as a comprehensive approach to fostering a culture of sustainability at SUTD. By doing so, SUTD can contribute to the sustainable development and inspire future generations to prioritize environmental stewardship. So to start off, I'm delighted to invite our president, Professor Chong Tao Chong, to give us the opening address. So Prof Chong was appointed president of SUTD in April 2018. He had been SUTD's founding provost since 2010, where he played an instrumental role in steering the strategic development and operationalization of SUTD. As president, he provides leadership and guidance in the next phase of SUTD's growth and development, as well as ensuring the continuity in the pursuit of SUTD's vision, mission, and strategic goals. So Prof Chang was from MIT's class of 88, where he graduated with a Doctor of Science in Electrical Engineering. So, welcome, Prof Chang. Thank you, uh, Corina. Professor Maria Super, Mr. Li Ziyang, Chairman of SUTD Board of Trustee and Member of Board of Trustee, colleagues, friends. In fact, I'm so happy to see so many familiar faces. And distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Welcome to SUTD's iconic voice from MIT. I'm very pleased to bring this event physically back to the public after a gap of four years due to the pandemic. So today, we are honored to have Professor Maria Zuper, MIT's Vice President for Research, as our esteemed speaker. I believe she will share about MIT's effort and thought leadership in using fusion energy to accelerate innovation to meet global sustainability goal. Sustainability is a very complex issue that touches upon many areas of our society, from environmental conservation to social equity and also economic prosperity. Now, to preserve our planet and combat, combat uh, climate change, uh, there's a growing urgent needs for countries to focus on developing sustainable roadmaps to reduce carbon footprints. The role that institutes of higher learning play in helping to create a sustainable future cannot be underestimated. Universities have a responsibility to educate and inspire the next generation of sustainability champions who can drive change across different sectors. Besides that, universities are hubs of cutting-edge research and innovation for the development of green technologies and solutions. We can not only provide research and analysis that inform, that inform policy decisions related to sustainability, but also collaborate with industry, partners, government agency, and other organizations to develop and implement sustainable solutions. To show our strong commitment to sustainability, SUTD has outlined a comprehensive 
sustainability plan which encompasses a concept roadmap. Now, this roadmap consists of three strategic trusts, namely merging behaviour, circular design, and net zero networks. We will apply these three trusts in three interdisciplinary challenges, namely circular economy, habitat, urban metabolism, and smart social change for a circular economy. Through collaboration with external partners such as industry, government agency, and also non-profit organizations, we aim to extend the impact of SUTD's sustainability efforts. One way of doing so is to offer SUTD campus as a sustainability testbed. In this way, the university can provide a real-world environment for testing and implementation of research ideas that come out from our concept map. This approach not only contributes to more sustainable campus, but also equips students and our researchers with the knowledge and skills needed to tackle sustainability challenges beyond the university's wall. Now, on the education front, we have identified key sustainability issues to form what we call the university-wide design challenges. That means we can incorporate these challenges into projects across our curriculum, including all the degree program and also the capstone projects. This can be done in SUTD because we have a very uh, multidisciplinary and also collaborative uh, structure in our pillars. Yeah. We also have launched a master, not a master, sorry, a, a minor in sustainability by design and developed a continuous education training, CET, program in zero carbon for professionals and also individuals. So in conclusion, by fostering collaboration with industry and government and providing education to the next generation of talents, institutes of higher learning can play a critical role in driving the development of new technologies and solutions that can help create a more sustainable future for all. So thank you for taking your time off today, being here, and I hope you will enjoy Professor Chupas' talk. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Prof Chong. As part of SUTD's ongoing mission to inspire and nurture future leaders and innovators passionate about technology, design and sustainability, the SUTD Iconic Voices from MIT Lecture Series is a unique opportunity that features leading faculty from MIT. The series provides a platform for interaction with distinguished experts in the areas of science, architecture, technology, design, and sustainability. Past speakers include the Edison of uh, Medicine, Dr. Robert Langer, President Emerita of MIT, Dr. Susan Hockfield, Nobel Laureate for Physics, Dr. Jerome Friedman, Nobel Laureate for Medicine, Dr. Susumo Tonigawa, and Professor Melvavata, Mel Melvavala, at, an astrophysicist and recipient of the MacArthur Genius Award. The, M the iconic voices from MIT lecture is proudly sponsored by the Far East organization. So our speaker for today is Professor Maria Zuber, who is E.A. Gressworth Professor of Geophysics and Vice President of Research at MIT, where she's responsible for research, administration, and policy. Professor Zuber oversees MIT's Lincoln Laboratory and more than a thousand interdisciplinary laboratories and centers, including the Coach Institute for Integrative Cancer Research, the MIT Energy and Environmental Solutions Initiative, the Plasma Science and Fusion Center, 
the Research Laboratory of Electronics, the Institute of Soldier Nanotechnologies, Haystack Observatory, and MIT Nano. Professor Zuber also leads MIT's Climate Action Plan for the decade. So the topic for today, and I really struggle to ask Dr. Zuber which topic to talk about, yeah. It's um, climate leadership, collaborative models for innovation and progress. And the format will comprise of a 50-minute lecture and followed by a 20-minute dialogue with Q&A. So prepare for your questions, okay? So I am pleased to welcome Professor Zuba on stage. <laughs> Professor, please. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. God, it's so wonderful to see so many friends and colleagues uh, on a Friday afternoon seeing a scientific lecture. That, that says a lot of good, so thank you for being here. Um, so I thought that given the importance of the problem, I would talk to you today about the way that MIT is thinking about and doing um, in combating climate change. So, um, so let's, let's get right down to business here, okay? Now, the Paris Climate Agreement at COP21 um, reaffirmed the global goal of limiting the increase in global average temperature to two degrees um, with a, uh, a real pursuing effort to limit that to 1.5 degrees Celsius, okay? Now, to meet that 1.5 degree target, what does that mean? Okay, it means by 2030, um, we need to cut our carbon dioxide emissions more or less in half, and then by 2050 to get to net zero. And then at 2050, if we haven't gotten to net zero, um, it's going to require us to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere uh, in order to, uh, to make up for what we didn't do by 2050, okay? Um, also, carbon dioxide is not our only greenhouse gas. We also need to dramatically reduce uh, non-CO2 greenhouse gases, uh, such as methane, and we had a methane commitment um, at the last, uh, the last COP. So, in other words, what this requires is we've got to absolutely transform our global energy system, okay? And, um, and what that is going to require, and, and I, I don't use this word lightly, uh, this is absolutely unprecedented. Okay. All right. So, um, so it's a big challenge, um, but uh, I stand before you today uh, full of optimism. Okay, uh, because it's a problem to be solved, and um, and so uh, what I'd like to do in this talk is talk a little bit about the science to level set us. Uh, you know, we're all informed citizens, and we're data driven. So we need to take a look at the data. Um, and, then, um, and then after that, we'll look at uh, some of the kind of solutions um, that we're talking about, some, some, some that are going on right now, uh, some that have yet to be uh, realized. But you'll see that there's a lot going on in this space. OK, so let's, um, let's start out here. And, um, and w what you see, uh, this is a plot of, um, of yearly temperature um, above and below the, uh, the average temperature between uh, uh, 1900 and uh, the year 2000, okay? So, um, so the average temperature during that century is zero, and then, um, and then you see the difference from that average year by year. And, um, and so um, what you can tell is uh, it's getting warmer. Okay. Now, we talked about that 1.5 degree goal, um, and the World Meteorological Organization uh, has indicated that we're going to cross that threshold um, in the next number of years, okay, um, if we don't 
take strong actions. And, um, and what you can see from this diagram is, is that we're already at about 1.1 degrees. Okay. Now, um, now the Earth is uh, changing. And actually, what's happening here from the combustion of fossil fuels, uh, it's predictable. In fact, it was predicted. More than a century ago, the Nobel Prize winning chemist, Svante Arrhenius, did a back of the envelope calculation and said if we doubled the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, it would raise global temperatures about four degrees. And actually, given what's happening now, we're about on track and, um, and Arrhenius was pretty close to being right. Okay. All right, uh, next. All right, so temperature um, on the y-axis there and um, uh, months of the year uh, along the x-axis. And here's some data that was uh, put together by the uh, European Center for uh, Medium Range um, Weather Forecasting. And, um, and this, actually, this figure has been in the news, so you may have seen it recently. And... Um, uh, the gray uh, marks there are uh, yearly temperatures um, over, you know, since about 1940, okay? Except for the last few years, those are the colored lines up at top. Um, and then the, um, the white line uh, corresponds to the year uh, 2023. And the reason that this has been in the news is that on July 4th, for the first time, the global average temperature rose above 17 degrees C. Okay, and um, and I I will um, let, let's be honest. Uh, the 2023 data are not yet fully calibrated. Okay, uh, um, however, um, they're not going to be far off. Uh, the the other data in here are uh, calibrated, and um, and so um, so it's. What's abundantly clear is that uh, we are in um, uncharted territory. Okay, now um, let me just say to you that there is nothing special about 1.5 degrees C, okay? We don't fall off a cliff at 1.5 degrees C, okay? Um, but clearly, every tenth of a degree rise in temperature um, has greater effects. I mean, we're already seeing um, uh, record storms, record droughts, record wildfires, extreme temperatures, and climate-induced migration. And those are only going to, um, to increase. And no matter how you look at it, we are right now living, in, living on a changed planet, okay? The planet that we are living in right now does not have the yearly weather that it had at the time that those of us who were adults um, were born, okay? And, um, and so uh, the effects are going to be felt all over the earth. Um, developing economies are going to be particularly affected by that, um, which uh, they're the most vulnerable populations. They contributed the least to the problem. Um, that is profoundly unfair, and, um, and it's something that we need to keep, keep in mind when we're thinking about uh, uh, the solution space here. So, um, so just a couple of examples. Um, you all watch the news, just like I do, uh, record monsoon rainfalls in um, Pakistan uh, last year, uh, record droughts, uh, here's the Lycée River in, uh, in France um, during, um, during the droughts last summer, and, um, and this is uh, last month in New York City, um, wildfires in Canada hundreds of kilometers away. Um, uh, caused uh, air on the East Coast to be um, nearly unbreathable. It was almost like COVID was back again because everybody had to wear masks uh, 
uh, to go out and do their business. Um, there has been a great deal of good work going on to try to quantify um, what the implications are of continual rising temperatures. And uh, this is a study that I particularly like, and it has a Singapore uh, relationship here. So this is, a, this is a computational study of the North China Plain, okay, which is a, a very important agricultural um, area um, in China. And, um, and this study was done by MIT professor Fatih El-Tahir and his colleague Sushal Kang uh, from the Singapore MIT Alliance. And, um, and they published this research, which, um, which looked at, um, uh, on the left-hand side here, this is uh, uh, average temperatures between 1975 and 200. Um, the, uh, the middle chart shows uh, temperatures that would ensue if there are what I'll call moderate uh, actions taken to reduce emissions. And, um, and the far right-hand side uh, shows the, the temperatures uh, if it's business as usual, okay, without climate mitigation measures. And, um, and the two uh, panels, the center and the right, are taken, uh, run out to later in this century. And what this shows, and it's, it's actually quite frightening, is that there are gonna be more and more instances of uh, hot weather. And what this study did, did that was a real innovation is that it included the effect of humidity arising from irrigation of the, the crops. Um, which, uh, and then looked at the heat stress that would ensue um, on humans. And, um, and so if, uh, if it's business as usual later in the, the century, um, healthy people will not be able to spend more than a few hours outside at a time. So how are you going to do the farming? Okay. So, um, so there are real consequences of... Um, of business as usual. So this chart, I think, really um, quite clearly um, underscores the magnitude of the response that's going to be required. So the, uh, the y-axis there is uh, gigatons of, uh, of CO2 equivalent emissions, so it can include methane and everything else. Okay. And then um, time is along the bottom axis. And um, the white line um, are emissions that have already taken place. And, um, and then um, the, the turquoise line at the top corresponds to um, uh, basically the commitments that were made at COP21, um, uh, you know, showing different probabilities of uh, uh, if those uh, emission goals were achieved. And then, um, and then on the bottom, um, the purple corresponds to if we stopped emitting CO2 right now, okay, um, and um, what it would take to limit uh, warming to two degrees C, uh, and, um, and the orange corresponds to um, limiting warming to 1 degrees, 1.5 degrees C uh, in order to get to, um, to net zero. So, um, so this, this indicates that even the Paris commitment, okay, doesn't get us anywhere near um, where we need to be. So we need um, an outright um, transformation, okay? And, um, and as I said at the beginning, uh, if we don't get to net zero, okay, which is the, the zero uh, line there, um, we need to implement on a global scale, which means gigaton scale, um, uh, carbon removal uh, um, activities uh, to take carbon, CO2 um, out of the atmosphere. So, um, so all of this uh, could be enough to really depress you, okay? 
um, because countries are cheating on their <laughs> emission commitments, okay? So it's, it's, it's not even as good as what you see um, in the turquoise um, line. Okay, um, but we're from MIT and, um, and we look for solutions and, um, and so we actually went through uh, about a year and a half long uh, community engagement process, about a year of which was during um, COVID, and, um, and had uh, probably 30 or 40 separate convenings of different components of our community on different topics, and, um, and said, what are we, what are we going to do about it, and what should the blueprint look like to start going down the road to solving this problem? Okay, and um, and we decided that um, uh, that we needed to work fast, and so um, so we named our plan Flash, Fast Forward, uh, our climate action plan for the decade, and um, and we decided that we needed to take two parallel approaches. Okay, we're calling them Track One and Track Two. So Track One, um, we take what we know, and we do as much as we can, as fast as we can, with what we know right now today, and reduce emissions as much as we can, okay? And that, we'll talk about this a little more, but that'll get us out to about 2040, okay? And, um, and then after that, we will have saturated uh, the, the global um, economy with the renewable solutions that we know, okay? And after that, we, in the meantime, have to discover other stuff to get us uh, from 2040 down um, ahead um, to net zero, okay? And so we need to, in this second track, we need to uh, conceive of new ideas, we need to innovate, we need to invest, we need to partner, and, um, and this is why I'm out here talking to you, um, because uh, there's a role in this for, um, for everybody. And, um, and you heard from uh, President Chow, uh, SUTD's commitment uh, to be a part of that solution, and there's plenty of room for that. So, um, so what I'm gonna do for the rest of the talk is basically unpack these two tracks and talk about some examples from each of the, the two tracks, okay? Now, um, there's no reason for you just to believe uh, me on this. Uh, independent um, organizations have looked at this uh, problem as well. And, um, and uh, this is um, an analysis that was done by the International, A International Energy Agency, which looked at hundreds of uh, energy solutions and how they would fit into a strategy um, in terms of uh, deployment. And, um, and they came to the conclusion um, of, well, we know enough right now. We, uh, with what we have available in nuclear and what we know how to do from renewables, we can get to 2040, but then, uh, then we're stuck, okay? And then to achieve net zero emissions by mid-century, um, we're going to have to um, commercialize, scale, deploy at global scale um, uh, prototypes of things that we're just conceiving of now. And actually, this is a, this is a very important study, okay? But what this study is missing is brand spanking new things that we haven't even thought about. Not things that we haven't just gotten to the prototype level yet, but ideas of things that, that haven't, um, uh, haven't crossed our minds yet, and there's room for that too. Okay, so, um, so let's start with uh, track, track one, which to summarize is the commercially um, available technologies. So honestly, there is, um, there is a lot of good news um, on this front. So um, the plot, um, the y-axis is the annual capacity of installations, okay? And on the 
right-hand side is uh, time, starting in the year uh, 2002 and going out to 2022. And so over the, um, the last 20 years, uh, the gray corresponds to new capacity of non-renewables, and the green corresponds to new capacity of renewables. So last year in 2022, 83% of the new capacity was due to renewables, okay? Um, so that is absolutely great news, okay? Um, the problem with it is that we need, um, we need to triple um, that annual global growth in renewals uh, to get to our 2030 goal, okay? So, um, so off to a good start, but more to be done. Okay, so what else needs to happen um, in track one? So, uh, so here are just some ideas. First of all, we've got to make uh, more rapid progress in improving energy efficiency in buildings, in industry, uh, in transportation. We can't uh, simply um, meet global temperature targets without significant progress in energy efficiency. And in fact, in the shorter term, energy efficiency um, is, is going to be quite important for us. Uh, second, we've, we've got to electrify um, both uh, transportation and um, building services. And then, um, and then third, we need to uh, improve and replace um, infrastructure. So um, Singapore is a younger developed country than the, the United States. In the United States, the grid um, isn't set up to deal with renewables, okay? We need a different kind of grid than the one, um, than the one that we have. Now, um, a good rule to live by is um, do no harm. We don't want to make things, we don't want to create as big or a bigger problem than we already have. And, um, and so in the, um, the goal of penetrating with uh, renewables, uh, we need to think about the health of our planet. And, um, and so I wanna talk a little bit about mining. So on the, this is a, a plot, this is another uh, analysis that was done by the International Energy Agency. And, um, and it lists uh, a variety of um, uh, low carbon or zero carbon solutions um, on the uh, uh, y-axis. And then across the top, um, we've got a number of important um, elements. And then um, the chart is color coded um, for uh, the uh, relative importance of all of these minerals for a particular clean energy technology. So low is red, um, blue is moderate, and green is, uh, green is high, okay? And, um, and so uh, this will not be news to most of you, but we have an over-reliance on rare um, critical um, minerals uh, that can harm our environment um, if they're mined. So, uh, so there's a lot of talk about sustainable mining, and, um, but there are threats uh, out there. So in thinking about the minerals that we need for these technologies, uh, we've got land mining. So a, uh, there, there's actually a contract that's been let in Peru uh, to, to actually uh, pipe water from the Pacific Ocean far inland, which isn't super cost effective, but they're trying to make the numbers work to uh, use desalinated water um, in, uh, in the mining to protect the, uh, the local um, asset, water assets that they have. Um, ocean mining is uh, uh, gaining a lot of interest. Um, so the Earth's seafloor um, is created at mid-ocean ridges, which are hot, which brings melted mantle rocks up to the surface, and there are literally trillions of nodules of, you know, polymetallic material 
that contain um, important minerals such as cobalt, manganese, zinc, some lithium, um, up from uh, the inside of the earth. And, um, but there are um, not well understood uh, ecosystems there that would certainly be disrupted um, were ocean mining um, to, uh, to gain widespread popularity. Um, there's, there, there are even um, companies talking about mining asteroids, okay? And um, because uh, there are some asteroids that have a, a very uh, high percentage of, uh, of the kind of minerals that we're talking about here. Um, we know that from having meteorite samples. Um, there, there's the best one. Um, that asteroid 16 Psyche uh, is, is an asteroid that's actually 220 kilometers across. And we're sending a spacecraft there. Um, actually, I'm a member of the team. Okay. And, um, and this asteroid is metallic. So it's uh, the, the closest thing we have to the core of a planet where the mantle, it was in a collision and the mantle broke off. And so we have a metallic um, asteroid. But to simply send a spacecraft, and this is, um, this is uh, between Mars and Jupiter, actually closer to Jupiter than Mars, uh, to just take a, a spacecraft and go out there and to go into orbit and just map it, okay, not land and mine and bring anything back to Earth. Um, it costs, uh, the price of the mission is uh, $900 million, okay? So even if you could do this, it's not going to be cost effective anytime soon. So the, um, the better answer, okay, for all of this um, is to, wherever possible, to substitute common Earth materials for these rare Earth materials, okay? Materials that are more commonly found in um, nature. Okay, and we'll, we'll talk more about that because we're now gonna talk about track two. Okay, so track two, um, uh, where we need to um, discover new things and, uh, and develop new solutions. And um, this, uh, these are some uh, temporary buildings that don't exist anymore that were built on the uh, MIT campus at the beginning of the Second World War. And, um, and you might think it's, why am I showing um, Second World War buildings, um, talking about future solutions for climate change? So these, um, these buildings are, are actually quite well known. Um, this is uh, um, Building 20. It's the, the MIT Radiation Laboratory, or the Rad Lab. And this is um, one of the two places where radar was, um, was developed. And, um, and uh, this was uh, a very, very dedicated project. The, the other place was Britain, by the way. And, um, and so just to give you an idea of what the discovery and the development of radar meant, um, in 1942, um, 117 uh, Allied ships were sunk by German U-boats, okay? And in uh, 1943, after radar was instituted, nine, okay? And, um, and so clearly things changed a lot um, when we had the ability to track um, German U-boats. And there were, um, there were other benefits as well. But the point is we need a rad lab type of um, dedication and programs um, in order to, uh, to solve this problem. So, um, but you know, everything, everything can't be and doesn't have to be a breakthrough, okay? Uh, we'll talk about breakthroughs, but um, uh, we need batteries, okay? And, um, and they're, there are not very likely to be um, uh, breakthroughs in battery technology. There's a lot more likely to be a lot of really important systematic incremental progress in all kinds of batteries because we need all kinds of batteries. So you know, we need the batteries for our phones. 
uh, we need grid scale batteries. So we need batteries um, that will kick in and uh, last when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining. And um, so this is a this is a um, uh, a demonstration, a, a schematic of a demonstration project, and two demonstration projects have been funded and approved um, by this company, Form Energy, um, by MIT professor Yetming Chang. And, um, and the, this, uh, this battery technology um, is designed to, um, uh, for a grid outage of 100 hours, okay, which would, um, which would work for um, most outages. And the, the beauty of, um, of this battery, it's a metal air, uh, battery, and um, and the uh, the composition of the battery is uh, the com components of this battery are iron, water, and air. Okay, so three really um, uh, common earth materials. And um, and when you think about battery discharging, um, batteries just discharge in the energetically favorable. Direction. So what happens here? You add water to iron, and it rusts. So that's the energetically favorable um, direction. But then you want to recharge this battery. Okay. So so what you do is you put an uh, electric field um, to take the rust that you produce, um, convert the hydroxide, and turn it back to iron. Okay. And then you, you essentially unrust. The rust, okay, and um, and this works, okay. And of the metal, the class of metal air batteries, uh, only iron, zinc, and lithium can can bo be both discharged and recharged. So these are common earth materials that can solve the really important problem of long-term storage. Okay, so this is an example of the kind of solutions uh, that'll work. Okay. Um, Food systems is uh, another important area. So one third of human uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions are associated with food systems. A major source of these emissions is the production and the use of fertilizers. Okay, we're essentially um, converting uh, nitrogen um, to ammonia. Uh, the process that has been used has been used for a long time. It's called the Haber-Bosch process. Um, this process, unfortunately, is um, energy intensive, and so, uh, so there's a way around it. So MIT scientist Chris Voigt um, is, uh, has figured out a way to, um, to teach plants uh, to actually fix their own nitrogen so that they don't need um, fertilizers. So this has, in addition to the energy savings, this has the additional benefit of... Uh, um, preventing runoff of fertilizers, which is the cause of things like the red tide, which is, uh, you know, has other environmental problems. Okay, um, so 40% of emissions are associated with buildings. And, um, and uh, in the last couple of days here, I've just had a lot of fascinating discussions with uh, uh, SUTD students and faculty uh, uh, in a lot of areas of uh, building and environmental design. And so, um, so I thought I would show you a design here for um, uh, a carbon house. So the, the best solution that you can have is if you take um, a quantity of something that nobody wants and you use it for something useful, okay? And, um, and so here, uh, this is uh, an idea of, of actually taking carbon and, um, and creating building materials out of it. So solving the building problem um, at uh, um, low energy. Um, the human-made mass on the planet already exceeds the biomass. And there is going to be much, much more need for housing. And so this is one potential part of the solution. Okay, um, all right, fission. Okay, um, one more uh, track two example. So researchers at MIT and other places are seeking to develop uh, nuclear micro reactors or, or what they call nuclear batteries. And these would be fueled by very, very low enriched um, uranium. Um, 
even some of the designs you spent nuclear rods, so you're solving two problems at once. You're solving the nuclear waste problem by using these. And, um, and so, so actually, these are being designed in a way that, that they can be put in a shipping container, built at a factory, put in a shipping container, and shipped um, so that you, um, you can actually avoid on-site construction. Okay, and construction overruns have been the biggest uh, contribution to cost increases of nuclear projects over the last 20 years. So this is, uh, and the, um, the beauty of these systems is that they uh, not only produce electricity, but they can produce heat. Um, if you think about it, uh, a, a nuclear battery could run your desalination plant, you could put one on your campus, it could charge all of your EVs, okay? So there are really, really um, innovative solutions um, that are involved with, um, with nuclear battery technologies. Okay, now the, um, the, the last track two um, example that I'm gonna give is uh, what uh, Professor Chong referred to um, in his opening remarks. Um, and that's fusion, which is the power of the sun, okay? And, um, and so the, the, um, the joke about fusion is that it's always been 40, no matter when you talk, it's always been 40 years in the future, but the future is here um, because um, uh, there, there actually has now been a demonstration of uh, net positive energy for the first time. And, um, and so uh, what has happened to kind of change the, change the game. So, so I'm gonna talk about um, MIT's um, approach to, uh, to fusion. So, um, so, so our work in this area, we've been working on fusion um, at technologies at MIT, both the, um, both the technology and the physics for 60 years, okay? And we were funded by the Department of Energy, okay? And then, um, they decided to cut off our funding on our fusion experiment because they were taking the whole U.S. fusion um, uh, budget and contributing it to the international ITER effort, which is a, a very large experiment um, in France. And um, and so um, so a graduate class in fusion. Um, got together and they came up with a design for a new type of, uh, of fusion experiment, um, which, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute here. But uh, what are the benefits of, um, of doing this? So the approach that we're taking is something called a tokamak, which is a, essentially a Russian word for donut. And, um, and what this is is uh, accelerating... Um, plasma particles um, within a magnetic field. And uh, there are decades of experience, not only at MIT, but worldwide um, on this. There are lots of large supercomputer codes that have validated these processes. Um, there are many, many trained people who have an understanding of uh, fusion. Um, and so, um, and there was a decision to pr proceed with this international ITER experiment, which was a $10 billion effort, which is a real sign of confidence from the international community that, um, that this makes sense. Now, um, and the, the physics here is very well known. So, um, so but there, there has been an innovation, and the innovation has been in the technology. So on the right-hand side, what you see there um, is a... Uh, high temperature superconducting tape. Now there was a Nobel Prize given for high temperature superconductors in 1987, but it was only now that it was possible to realize this and create a technology um, that could be used. So these uh, high temperature superconducting tapes allowed much higher magnetic fields than in other tokamak experiments. And the power density um, out of a tokamak um, is proportional to the magnetic field to the fourth power. So, um, so essentially, what this has allowed 
is um, the the eater experiment, which the, you, there's a plot of risk on the vertical axis and uh, speed, slow and big on the left hand side, and fast and small on the right hand side, and um, and the eater experiment is about the size of a soccer pitch, okay? And by using these high temperature superconducting tapes, you can produce the same uh, magnetic field in a device that is um, about the size of a high school gymnasium, okay? And so, um, and it's also possible to make it modular so that if you need to change out parts, you can remove a part, put a new part in, you, you don't have to disassemble large parts of the experiment. So um, uh, in September of, uh, of 2021, um, the magnets were tested um, at, uh, at MIT and achieved the magnetic field that would be required to get uh, uh, 10 times as much energy out of the experiment as you put in. So for those of you who are familiar with this, it's uh, parameter Q of 10. And, um, and so this is a joint study um, between the graduate students left and formed a startup named Commonwealth Fusion Systems. Uh, some of the basic research is still being done um, at MIT. On the left-hand side, you see a schematic of, uh, of the device, and so you can see the size of it. And on the right-hand side is uh, the actual construction um, uh, of the device. And, um, and this, uh, uh, the, uh, this experiment, uh, if it stays on track, and it has so far achieved every milestone, which isn't to say that it'll achieve the milestone that it has for tomorrow, but it has achieved every milestone so far, um, is expected to get to net positive energy in um, 2025. But it's not just that experiment, okay? Um, Commonwealth Fusion Systems is one of 37 member companies in the Fusion Industry uh, Association. And, um, and in my estimation, th there's probably five of them um, that can get to net positive energy on the 2025 to 2030 um, time frame. Some of them uh, aren't releasing anything about what they're doing, and so we just don't know. Um, but Commonwealth Fu Fusion Systems had their um, Series B uh, offering um, uh, not long after the uh, battery test that I just told you about and they raised uh, $1.8 billion, and it, uh, it was the uh, largest startup ever in Massachusetts. It was the largest startup ever for a fusion company. And so, um, so if it was 40 years away, um, the private sector probably wouldn't be investing um, at that level. So, um, and again, I just wanna um, emphasize here that what we're seeing now happening very quickly uh, started many decades ago um, in the, the laboratories. So this is, um, this is tough tech. And, um, and so in these track two um, technologies that we're talking about, um, they, they don't work with the usual investment offering where you get an infusion of cash and then you're expected to have a prototype. Um, tough tech takes a longer term investment. And MIT understood that, and so we, we actually um, developed our own um, venture firm, and it's called The Engine. Um, we developed it five years ago for these tough tech technologies, and Commonwealth Fusion Systems is one of the um, companies in that portfolio. So, um, so the formula, so what you need for track two. Um, so the left-hand side, um, you need uh, a lot of investments, you need a lot of ideas. So the only way to have a good idea is to have lots of ideas, okay? Because uh, if, you were, if you had a whole lot of clean energy solutions on the table and you had to pick one, probably fusion wasn't one that you would pick uh, at the beginning. So you have to have a range uh, of investments with differing risk levels. And, um, 
and you need to have patient capital um, because the investments are going to, in some cases, take longer um, than the usual type of uh, um, investments that venture firms do. And then um, finally, there need to be partnerships between um, investors, inventors, um, and entrepreneurs. And so, um, so at MIT, that's what we're doing. We're doing many other things as well. We have a consortium um, with non-energy companies who want to get to net zero and who want to be first movers and who want to um, learn best practices and pass them on to others um, in their sector and in other sectors. Um, in our energy initiative, we have a future energy system center where we're bringing together, um, uh, we perform integrated analyses of uh, the entire energy system in collaboration with industry partners. And we have a grand challenges program to look for uh, innovative ideas that if realized could change the game. Okay, so, um, so, le so let me end here now. Um, with, um, with the most famous photograph ever taken of the Earth. And, um, and so this um, photograph was taken by the Apollo 8 astronauts uh, on Christmas Eve in 1968. And, um, and this, is, this is the photograph that started the environmental movement, okay? And, um, and uh, you know, it makes sense to look at this uh, image with a little bit of context if you go back and you think about 1968 and what was going on, um, uh, the world was facing war, racial strife, uh, intergenerational tension, economic uncertainty, political turmoil, and yet we did this. Um, you know, everything that we know or love or have done is on that small blue planet. And, um, and I would humbly submit to you that our species did not summon all that it took to do that, um, only to diminish and decimate the earth that we're going to leave to our children um, and our grandchildren. And so, um, so the road ahead is uh, difficult. Um, however, um, we got a plan. And, uh, and a plan takes uh, execution, um, and it takes partners. And if all of us work together, um, today's the day that we roll up our sleeves and we get moving, and we start moving down um, the road. Because um, uh, this requires human solutions. It requires changes of behavior. Uh, it requires technical solutions, um, and it requires all of us, but it's very possible. And so I'll end right there. Thank you, Professor Zuber. That was fascinating. So maybe I, I can invite you to take a seat while we start the dialogue se segment of the talk. Yeah, so to start off the dialogue, we will also invite our president, Professor Chong to join us on stage, as well as joining us on stage will be SUTD's Chief Sustainability Officer, Professor Erwin Virai. Professor Virai led the sustainability initiatives in SUTD to address our environmental um, responsibility from the university. And he was the head of architecture and sustainable design pillar for five years. Prof Virai also sits as a chair of the jury for the Singapore President Design Awards. So let us put our hands together to welcome them. And if you have any questions, I will welcome your questions um, by going to the mic. And to start off, maybe Prof. Wiray can start off some, with some questions for Prof. Chung and Prof. Zuber first. So maybe uh, may I express appreciation uh, to uh, Dr. Maria Zuber, Professor Maria Zuber, for inspiring us to do everything we can, as fast as we can, with the tools that we have now. And then also inspiring us to uh, 
have that collaboration and, and working with everyone in the community to do what we can now. And maybe to give you a bit of a rest from that long 50-minute lecture, <laughs> I would ask Professor Chong a question. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Professor Chong. Yes. I, I wanted to ask you because you mentioned that there were three things that SUTD uh, wanted to do in terms of sustainability. And then one part of that is nudging behavior. Uh, maybe if you could explain a little bit of that nudging the behavior, because I think that maybe we take for granted what is nudging behavior. Okay. <laughs> You're testing me whether I'm paying attention to the talk, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, when we talk about nudging behavior, I think we, we believe that if we talk about sustainability, right, it cannot be sustainable without behavioral change. I think. Uh, Professor Zuber also talked about we need to change our behavior. So I hope when we roll out our sustainability plan, especially let's say we use our campus as a test bed, so we get our students involved. And when test bed, they mean you actually live in it. So our students will have to experience it and make it not thinking it as, a, as an unhappy thing that they want to do, but, or it's not a chore, but they really think that it is important to do it because it is not just for themselves, also for their children, or their children's children, right? So I think if you think on that way, I hope with that, they will have that behavioral change. And we nudge them by showing the path for them to go to, otherwise they may go different directions. So SCTD want to use a test bed in addition to our many design challenges, micro innovation to guide them along so that now they become doing it as a habit, not because there's some camera looking at you, then you do it. Yeah. So that is what we mean by nudging behavior. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Chong. So I think that it uh, somehow emphasizes the uh, individual and personal responsibilities that we have, so our everyday behavior. And so maybe to get to know Professor Sober better, to go into asking you about your role as Vice President of Research at MIT, because you oversee more than 12 research centers, and then also you have your own specialty. So how do you go about this? And then how behaviorally you behave in order to uh, realize what MIT is planning and then what maybe you think should be done? In a, in a research environment, everybody has a dream, okay? Everybody has a, an idea that they want to pursue, pursue. Everybody has a goal. And in many cases, there's something preventing them from uh, achieving that goal, okay? Sometimes they need money, um, but sometimes, sometimes they need a, a bigger lab to do something. Sometimes they just they need a new piece of equipment. Sometimes they just have to meet the right person who, who knows something critical that they don't know. And, um, and so the, you know, my role as the vice president for research is to remove barriers, okay? To, you know, whatever is holding somebody back, to try to look at that and um, and try to remove that barrier so they can take the next step. And, um, and so, um, so I'm not, you know, an expert in all the many um, areas that I oversee, uh, but I, um, uh, I bet on people, okay? <laughs> and, um, and MIT does a pretty good job of only bringing people that are worth betting on. And, um, and so that, that's really the way that uh, I operate. Uh, thank you very much for sharing that. I think you also have very fascinating uh, research on your own. And then maybe because of that and the work that you do at MIT, you have served uh, five presidents of the United States as their advisor. Yeah. Uh, in 2004, as Commission on the Implementation of U.S. Space Exploration Policy under President George Bush. And then the National Science Board uh, 
under President Barack Obama from 2013 to 2018, and chair of the board from 2016 to 2018. And then uh, the National Science Board under President Donald Trump. And then now as co-chair of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology under President uh, Biden. And so uh, maybe to ask you uh, how your individual and personal uh, interests and the qualities that you have, and then your work at MIT uh, somehow impact this work that you do for the President of the United States. And then also maybe to ask you, how is it to work for the President of the United States? <laughs> that's, that's interesting, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so my, my own research is in um, space, okay? You saw that I, uh, you know, running the gravity experiment on a, a, astro a metallic asteroid mission. Um, and, um, and so, um, so that's, that's fundamental research, okay? Um, you know, at, at some point, and all I've ever wanted to do is study space. At some point, um, I came to realize that, um, that science can actually help people, okay? And, and so that's what, um, what motivated me towards um, participating in public service. And, um, and, um, and so I've, you know, I've, it's, been, um, it's been a great honor to work um, for four presidents, okay? And um, the one I've worked most closely with is, uh, is President Joe Biden. And, um, and it's, it's absolutely incredible to work for someone who has as many responsibilities as, uh, as he has, who absolutely uh, loves science and, um, and, and cares about science. And, um, and President Biden says, uh, if, I, if I have to explain America in one word, it's possibilities. And, um, and science provides possibilities for a, for a better future. And so when you, um, when you work for the President of the United States, um, you know, the, as, as scientists, our tendency is to say, what's the best thing I can do scientifically? Um, but when you work for the President of a country, uh, you have to always, always be thinking about how can science make people's lives in the country better, okay? And so you, you really have to look through a lens um, that is, is much more personal and, and how to uplift people. So it is, thank you very much, it is for people. And so I think that uh, with that, maybe uh, understanding of you, uh, we could start the conversation with everyone. So we could start with the questions. Yes, please. My name is um, Saud Sadiq. Um, and um, I have established, co-founded a company in Singapore, uh, Tigris, uh, which is exclusively based on sustainability. Um, I've been involved with sustainability for more than 35 years. Before even the, wor uh, the word sustainability was coined, um, I'm currently, in my personal capacity, uh, on the board of Windrock International, which is one of the leading international development institutions in the world, established by the Rockefeller family. Uh, we are doing projects in more than 60 countries. Uh, the fo focus is exclusively sustainability. But uh, Professor Zuber wanted to thank you for a very interesting, informative, and uh, insightful uh, presentation. Um, uh, Professor Chung, I'm also very happy to learn about uh, SUTD's work in nurturing, and uh, you'd also mentioned earlier circular economy. But it's, it's great to uh, understand, uh, Professor Zuber, about the work that, is, that has been done already, and you're doing, continuing to do so, in understanding the implications of climate change. This is an area that um, our company is very much involved with. 
Um, and I'll, uh, just before I ask my two questions, just wanted to give you very briefly a sense of what we are trying to do. Now, you talk about technology solutions and what's required and you know, what has been done so far and what is needed to be done in the future. Very much, uh, you know, th those are um, very much true. But in my view, there are already so many great institutions uh, including MIT, of course, but the university that I graduated from, Cornell University, uh, and others who have been doing a lot of work, research on sustainability, yeah, institutions, research institutions, entrepreneurs. And there are thousands of technology solutions that exist today that can deal with climate change. The problem which is what we are focusing on with our company in, in Singapore, is that all these great technology solutions developed in the lab, uh, research institutions, never get deployed in the market. Okay, so that is, so first mile funding is there, but last mile mar funding and market connectivity isn't there, right? So this is a huge, huge problem which has not been addressed. Uh, we're trying to address this with the work that we're doing at Tigris. Um, what is challenging, and I've been involved in climate change and how to do this, the vast majority of companies in the world that are involved with technology solutions are related to climate change, water, et cetera, are SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises not just startups, but companies that have gone beyond being a startup. And the problem is they don't have access to funding, which would allow, which would help them to deploy those technologies. The formal financial markets, banks, other institutions ignore them. Okay. Also, there is an issue of providing management guidance, strategy, strategic. This, I believe, is a huge, huge gap. And even if new technology solutions are develop, developed, the climate change issue will not be addressed adequately. So my question is, I mean, the, the needs are to address climate change are more than $10 trillion, okay? And we have developed a model to how to actually deploy technology solutions to the market. Now, I'm wondering, would MIT um, and SUTD do you share the view that I've expressed in terms of what is one of the biggest challenges to getting technology solutions which can address the climate change issues that you've discussed, right? Would you share that view? And two, is MIT and SUTD prepared to work in addressing this huge challenge which has not been addressed fully or adequately by the leading universities and research institutions in the world. Okay, uh, so I'll, I'll start with that. Thank you for those comments. And, and you're, you're absolutely right that getting things uh, out of the lab and deployed um, has been an impediment, okay? And, um, um, and, and it's not just getting them deployed, but it's getting them deployed and scaling up to global level where they yes, can actually yes. make a difference, right. okay, because we kind of need gigaton solutions. So, um, so I absolutely share that view. And, um, and so MIT is addressing that, okay. Sure. MIT, uh, as I said in my talk, um, formed its own venture company um, called The Engine, okay, which, um, it, you know, MIT put some money in it, but uh, what we did is basically used our reputation to attract um, investors to um, to provide capital for um, for promising um, energy and other solutions um, in order to uh, to scale up. So, uh, but you know MIT can't do this uh, alone. So every regional area ought to have the equivalent of an engine. Okay. So so actually in you know, in the Boston area, 
um, you know, I'm confident that the most promising startups can find access um, to funding. You know, whether they can find, you know, the second and the third and the fourth infusion, um, you know, it depends how things go and, um, and not all of them can, but the engine is a mechanism for tough tech and long term. But the engine isn't enough and every region has to produce uh, something like that. And, and I'll just say um, that you're right that banks won't fund that, and I'm on a bank board, so I know. And that's, uh, you know, in the United States, uh, the uh, federal regulators would not allow the kind of investments that you're talking about because they're too risky for the banks. So, uh, so the regulators won't let banks take those risks. So it's not that the banks don't want to take those risks. The banks can't take those risks. So, okay, Professor Chow, do you want to add anything? Yeah, okay. Uh, I thought uh, Professor Zuber had mentioned at your last slide, last few slides, you talk about the three ingredients for success. I think for SUTD, we do have a lot of uh, ideas from our students because uh, we have... Uh, we have this, uh, this sort of design focus in our curriculum. Uh, but I think for us, the important thing is not just doing your own. So I think looking for your, your last point about partnership is a key. So for SCTD, when we look at our sustainability plan, uh, we, uh, of course, you know, encourage our students to, to, let's say, the test bed, uh, using uh, SCTD or test bed, they have ideas. We want to bring them up, but I don't think for this kind of large scale, or you want to have the last mile. Yes. Last mile. At least, yes. I think you need to partner with uh, the right, right uh, partners here. Lah. So I think partnership is quite important uh, for, for that. Yeah. So I think we will want to encourage our students to solve problems that are of interest of the society. Then you will definitely find partners that want to uh, uh, work with you. Therefore, we, we talk about uh, a circular economy, we talk about uh, even uh, urban meta metabolism, all this I think we will be able to find partners to work together with our startup. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe thank we you. can give a chance to the students to ask the question. Yes. Please state your name and which school you are from. Uh, mm. I'm Zhou Yue Lin. Uh, I'm from National Junior College. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zupa, for your very insightful sharing. My question is, what advice would you give to students or young people and entrepreneurs about tackling the scientific challenges that you highlighted? Yeah, what, what advice? Yeah. Um, so first of all, follow your dream. Um, mm -hmm. So there, 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 is a, there is a pathway, okay? Now, um, so where, where are you in your career? You're, you're a student, okay? Yeah. Do you want to go in an entrepreneurial direction? Do you even, do you yeah. even know? I, I've been thinking about it, yes. So, so my, you know, my first piece of advice is graduate. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. The, um, don't quit and start your company. That works out sometimes, and we all know the, you know, you know we all know examples where it did, but we, we don't talk about all the many, many, many more examples where it didn't. So, so graduate, okay? And then, um, and then if you're interested in starting a company, you need mentors. So there, there are organizations around with successful business people who have started companies that can give you advice on how to develop a business plan um, and and can move you in a direction um, that will put you in a good position to get funding to start things out. Okay, um, so and and these these opportunities they usually occur in areas around research universities. That's that's where these ecosystems reside. So so you want to seek out like-minded people and get yourself 
um, in that ecosystem and meet people. So, so you've got to be a little bit outgoing and meet people. And there's a lot of people out there who will want to give you advice and give you help and That's get true. some advice on who are, who are the right people to be doing that. Um, but there's, you know, there's every reason that if you want to move in a particular direction that, that you will have the opportunity to do that if you do what I just told you. So. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Dr. Zuba. Prof. Chong, you have mentioned the VIE. Thank you, yeah. Sorry. Maybe from... The VIE, the investment, our own investment. Oh, I see, yeah. I think you mean to the student, right? Hello? <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, in SUCD, we do have this thing called the venture innovation and entrepreneurship. And I think that is our unit that promote catalyst and also support uh, startup with in incubator and so on. Yeah, so there are this thing there. I think the best way for you after you graduate, join SUTD. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Welcome to SUTD. Yeah, we look forward to welcoming you. So moving on to this side of the aisle. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Sage. I'm going to Stanford University this fall, and I'm looking to getting into the space. So my question was regarding your role as an advisor to the US president. Um, you've worked with multiple presidents and from different ends of the political spectrum, all of whom have different priorities when it comes to funding climate change and sustainability. So in light of next year's elections, how do you navigate that sort of change in priorities between presidents? Um, is there a cause to be concerned for a cut to funding to climate change related areas? And what advice do you have to people in the private sector who are uncertain about government support coming to, uh, regarding sustainability? Ah, okay, so that's, that's interesting. Um, so, um, so I've, I've been very fortunate. You know, I've worked for two Republican presidents in the U.S. and two Democratic um, presidents. And, um, and obviously the advice that I give is non-political um, <laughs> uh, or, or else I wouldn't have worked for, um, for both parties. And, and you know, I, when I get asked a question like this, I, I usually give the answer that, you know, Two plus two equals four, no matter who the president is. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, so I, um, you know, what I, what I have always done is um, is looked at the priorities of the president and tried to think of ways that science can advance worthy priorities within the president's agenda. Okay. Um, when you when you work for the president, you're not there to promote your own agenda. You're you're there to support uh, and provide information so that good decisions can be made. So, so in the you know in in the United States, actually anywhere in the world, when there's an election and there's a, a change in party, there's uncertainty involved and there's a there's a change of priorities. But there's, you know, there's, there's core values that presidents want um, the, the country to be successful and profitable and the people to be, um, you know, uh, successful. And, and they have different ways of considering how to go about that. But I just look at what science has to offer. And sometimes, sometimes it's in the area of education, and sometimes it's in the area of workforce training. I mean, there, every single president wants the people in their country to have better jobs. And so, um, so there's a lot, you know, universities have a huge role, um, a huge role to play in, um, in helping that to happen. And, um, and you know, as, as far as the, the private sector goes, um, you know, I mean, 
you know, there's always uncertainty before an election. There's, I mean, there's nothing that I could say or President Chow could say that would remove uncertainty um, about what could happen. But, um, you know, I'll tell you what, I just keep my head down and I do my job. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm still around. So, so that's, that's the way that I think about it. Okay, thank you, Sage. Yeah. Hello, um, I'm Anir, I'm an incoming student of SCTD. So my question is more of, so how should supplementary industries such as healthcare evolve to support the increase in medical complications from a changing planet in a sustainable manner? Ah, okay. So, so first of all, uh, let, you may have something to say about this uh, too, but let me just start by saying that um, uh, health issues associated with climate change um, are, are huge, okay? And, um, and so the, um, the idea of, um, of the healthcare sector um, having, you know, a seat at the table and having to be a part of the solutions here um, is, uh, is, um, is absolutely essential. So there is, um, you know, at MIT, there's a huge amount of interest in um, all kinds of health-related fields in, um, in reacting to different aspects of climate change. So, you know, for example, the wildfires that, that you saw. So it, there are increases in respiratory problems for people and uh, firefighters' respiratory um, issues. And... Um, and so there's, you know, if you, if you just look at, you know, whatever field of healthcare that you're interested in, um, if you put your mind to it, you can um, undoubtedly think about an application that would be relevant to addressing the, the climate change problem. Yeah, I think when you talk about healthcare, especially when you have a society uh, that is becoming uh, aging. Like in, in Singapore, I think we all know that you will become a super age society very soon, in fact, in 20, 2030. Yeah, one, one out of four will be older. So, if you talk about sustainable healthcare, I believe that we have to go beyond the, just thinking about hospital, but beyond hospital to community. So, therefore, in the SUDD, we pay a lot of attention on health and wellness here. And if we can provide, if you look at, for example, uh, uh, environmental design, you know, estate design, uh, we have a lot of HDB flats, you know, how we can design so that the aging population, you know, can be actively involved in, in healthy uh, lifestyle. And this is the way I see what we mean by sustainable health and, and, and healthcare that, that we need. Yeah, that's just my view, yeah. Maybe to... Uh Compliment what Prof. Chong and uh, Dr. Suba has said that maybe within SUTD also, uh, it's part of the curriculum for the students to be involved in this. Uh, maybe the humanities, arts, social sciences courses, and then as they grow for, uh, farther and then they do their specializations, there are explorations being done actually in the different pillars also, like from EPD and then ESD. Uh, not only the the, the medicine or being uh, treated, but actually the implements, the, the okay. instruments actually in creating the, the treatment. And then also maybe even the systems also, and then maybe even the financing of certain things, which I think can be imagined uh, from, from the different uh, research possibilities that are being done by my friends and colleagues, and then which are also being done together with the students. So, as yesterday, uh, <laughs> Professor Suba actually went to take a look at the different uh, 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 researches going on here. I think maybe you've seen the 3D printing of food. That's one way also of uh, maybe uh, addressing the issue of healthcare itself, and and then also uh, other things like the sensors, etc. And and when the students uh, from architecture that we went to have a conversation presented. The question that uh, uh, Dr. Sabah asked is, so what will be the future plans that you would have? Would you have a partner to actually make it commercial and viable and available to everyone? So I think that these uh, opportunities are actually being open to the students and their colleagues within SUTD that 
we could actually imagine, have the ideas, we can dream, and then bring it to the world, I think. So maybe that's how we can address the issues of healthcare. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So maybe we move to the gentleman the other side for your question. Thanks for your patience. Thank you. My name is KK Wong, class of 75, MIT, course 10 and course 15. Uh, I'm rather old, therefore. <laughs> um, I have three questions. The first one deals with a uh, historical or global perspective. The second one deals with uh, uh, your work at MIT, and the third one deals with myself. Uh, the first question is, over the last 400 years, two to 400,000 year, years, the uh, concentration of carbon dioxide has been going up and down, and uh, concomitant with it, the temperatures of Earth. Um, now, we are now experiencing it going up largely, we believe, because of our activities, human activities, uh, over the last uh, 10,000 10, years, perhaps. And the, if we do nothing, if we do absolutely nothing, we will be completely obliterated and we can't evolve beyond that? Um, that's the first question. Uh, the second question is, um, how far is the commercialization of fusion energy uh, 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 from today, uh, whether by MIT or otherwise? The third question relates to, you mentioned, investment that MIT wants to attract from investors, uh, whether it is in fusion or other technologies. Uh, how would a person like me, an investor, plug into the investment um, uh, uh, opportunities that it, um, emerge from MIT? Okay, all right, a lot of questions there. So, um, <laughs> so the first question is uh, the record of, um, of CO2 um, in the atmosphere. And you know, if I heard it correctly, you know, you're saying CO2 has gone up and down, uh, which, which of, of course it has, but, but you know, now the CO2 level is greater than it has been in any time in recorded history. So, um, so what's, what's happening now is not natural. And you know, will CO2 go, go down again? Well, it will. So the, the emissions that, that are being made now, um, they will um, come out of the atmosphere, but the residence time of CO2 in the atmosphere is a thousand years. So, um, so unless we physically remove the, the CO2, it's gonna be around for a thousand years. And, um, and if we do nothing and CO2 continues to increase and you know, humanity dies off, the earth will be fine. Okay, um, you know, eventually the, the CO2 will um, come out of the atmosphere, but, um, but what's happening now is not normal, and it's not part of the um, change of CO2 in the atmosphere that, that is related, associated to the Milankovitch cycles associated with the Earth's rotation and, and orbit, okay? Um, let's see, the... Um, this, the second question? Commercialization of fusion tech. Yeah. The, the, second, question. the second question deals with the commercialization oh, of the Oh, the commercialization, tech. okay. So, um, all right, so I'll tell you what, there, um, there has been enough research done on um, the, the tokamak that, that we're building, and you know, there have been many tokamaks and, um, and we have a good enough understanding of, um, of the magnets and, and by doing the 20 Tesla um, demonstration, um, we've removed the biggest technological barrier um, to achieving net positive energy. So, um, so while things that could go wrong, they're technology issues, there isn't any unknown science. So, so I actually feel comfortable that that experiment will achieve net positive energy. Now, okay, 
we're all so fixated on achieving net positive energy um, that uh, the, the driving issue has not been how to make this cost effective. Okay, at, at Commonwealth Fusion, they're, they're using the best materials they can use with the best thermal properties, the best tensile properties, the best compressive properties. And, um, and so, you know, the, the, the ideal cost model is designing um, an experiment or a power plant that produces as much power as a coal-fired power plant for the same cost. Okay, because then it's game over. Nobody's going to build a coal-fired power plant anymore. And, um, and I think at this point, we have no idea um, about how long it's going to take um, to gain the experience to make that um, commercially viable. But I will say that from the very beginning, that experiment has been designed with a commercial application in mind. It hasn't been designed as a science experiment and then someday we'll turn it into a, to a, um, a company. Okay, all right, and then- The, the third uh, question is how can, the third question yeah. is how, how can, can Mr. Wong invest, invest? in this? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll put you in yeah. contact with Katie Ray who runs the engine, so. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And. Uh, Gentleman there, yeah, go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Zuber. I'm Kyuha and I'm a student of SUTD. To my knowledge, some of the things needed to run a nuclear fusion plant, such as tritium and helium-3, is very costly to purify and get them to be available. May I know if there's any solutions to tackle this issue? Thank you. Yeah, oh, okay, so, um, so, uh, so a, a big question, um, with, uh, with, with fusion, uh, and this relates to the tritium, is can you produce um, enough neutrons um, to, to make the experiment self-sustaining, essentially, okay? And, um, and um, for, um, for an experiment the size of ITER, um, I think it produces 1.1 neutrons per interaction, which you, you need the neutrons for the tritium. 1.1 um, uh, neutrons per interaction, which means it's not going to be self-sustaining. And separate analysis has been done for, um, for the SPARC experiment, um, indi indicating, I believe, three neutrons per uh, collision, which, which would make it self-sustaining, um, which would mean that the experiment could produce what it needed to continue to fuel itself, okay? And, um, and the, uh, the uh, CFS people have a, um, uh, a US DOE grant funded to actually do an experimental verification of that theoretical um, paper to, to demonstrate um, uh, that result, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Prof. Suba. Um, last question. Go ahead. Uh, good evening, professors. Um, my name is Norman, and I'm currently undergraduate in SUSS, Singapore University of Social Sciences. So, um, okay, just a context uh, to, for myself is that I'm an astronomy geek. So usually during my leisure time, I would just uh, read some topics on astronomy. And I just have one question to... Uh, submit to Dr. Zuber. Uh, if possible, I just would like to have a, a very generic perspective on um, how do you uh, evaluate the progress on sustainability in the uh, astronomy uh, sector? So in particular, the like NASA organization, uh, how do you uh, evaluate the progress on sustainability? So this is my first question. And my second question will be, what is the current biggest challenge that NASA organization is facing when it comes to sustainability? Yeah, that's all for my two questions. Thank you. You know, all of the NASA centers and the Jet Propulsion Lab, Applied Physics Lab, um, they all have sustainable processes and sustainable goals. 
and, um, and they have to operate them um, with respect to those goals. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I can't go into the details, but they all, they all have procedures that they have to follow. So that's, that's how they do that. Okay, and then the other question is, what is the most challenging thing that NASA is working on right now? So, um, so two things. Uh, I'll, I'll give you two things. So, um, so first of all, we're sending astronauts back to the moon, and um, and so uh, so that's a big deal because uh, we haven't done that for um, for many decades, and so that that is is going to be a, a big challenge and a and a great challenge. Um, and then the um, the second thing on the robotic side is um, there's a uh, um, so there's a rover on Mars right now that is collecting samples um, in Jezero Crater, and um, and the next mission to Mars is going to bring those rocks back. So a helicopter is going to go around and collect the rocks, you know, put them in a little device, launch them off Mars, bring them back. Uh, to Mars, or bring them back to uh, to Earth from Mars, and um, so that is the um, that that's probably the hardest thing we've done on the robotic side. Thank you very much. Yeah, sorry, that that was the last question. As uh, um, thank you very much for everybody's interest um, in learning from Professor Zuber, and we are now vastly overrun in terms of time. So thank you very much, everyone, for attending. And with very interesting questions as well as insights from uh, Professor Zuber and Professor Chong. So on behalf of the SUTD family, I would like to invite Prof Chong to present a token of appreciation to Professor Zuber, please. Okay, we have come to the end of the Iconic Voices from MIT lecture. Thank you, everyone. Drive safe, and have a good weekend. <laughs>